we have a pretty good idea of what it's like to be filthy rich in the present. Garages full of exotic cars and an architecture digest tier estate. But what was the life of a millionaire like around two centuries ago? Well, let's take a look at the life of industrialist Andrew Carnegie to get the idea. Carnegie maintained two residences. In the early 1900s, he built the Andrew Carnegie Mansion on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, New York. The house was designed not to stand out while still being super roomy. It still had a few Architecture Digest worthy details. It was one of the first houses to have a steel frame, central heating, and a private elevator. It spread over 1.2 acres and was three and a half stories high. Carnegie prioritized having gardens at his mansion, and the place featured a grassy lawn at the front and a small garden in the west wing. In 1905, Carnegie purchased a townhouse east of the mansion as a residence for his daughter, and the townhouse is now part of the estate. If you'd like to see the place for yourself, it's still there on Fifth Avenue. The Carnegie Corporation sold it to the Smithsonian, and it now houses the Cooper Hewitt Museum. Honestly, even if you didn't care about Carnegie, it's worth making a trip to his old digs to visit the museum. The collection features relics and artifacts that show the history of decoration and design. It even has a restored chair that was used by Abraham Lincoln. As for the mansion, both the interior and exterior have been restored, so you can still get a feel for how a millionaire in the 20th century would live. That lift we mentioned earlier is actually part of the museum's collection. We can't help but wonder if Carnegie would be able to afford a two-bed and two-bath for his family in Manhattan today, let alone on Fifth Avenue. As cool as the Carnegie Mansion was, his vacation house in Scotland was way cooler. Let's talk about his castle. The earliest records of the Skibo Castle in Sutherland, Scotland show that it served as the residence of the Bishops of Catness. It was passed down from bishop to bishop until it was snatched away to become the potato in a centuries-long game of hot potato. Carnegie bought the castle in 1895 for 85,000 pounds, which is slightly under three million dollars in 2021. He ended up spending more on renovating the castle, but that did give him a chance to expand the castle grounds by 44,000 square feet and add an indoor swimming pavilion and a nine-hole golf course. Amazingly, this castle was just the Carnegie family's vacation home, but the family retained ownership of it till 1982. Can you visit Skibo Castle? You can, but it won't be easy. One option would be to battle for public tea sessions at the golf course, but your best bet would be to join the uber-exclusive Carnegie Club. The golf course and swimming pavilion are still there, monuments to Carnegie's fabulous wealth and how he used it. We think the real treat would be to get to explore its massive acreage, with the Scottish baronial exterior and Edwardian interior perfectly preserved by the current ownership. The club's website has pictures, and it looks both cool and like something out of a haunted castle movie. Memberships to the club are hard to get, though. Contrary to Carnegie's reputation for being a great philanthropist, the club that's named after him only allows people it deems worthy to set foot in Skibo. So far, Carnegie must sound like your average rich person. Except for the fact that he couldn't really buy a Ferrari in the 1900s. Sure, he donated some of his money, like every rich person does. But what we haven't really told you is that Carnegie made an actual reputation for himself as a good Samaritan in his later years. The man tried to live his life by a pretty famous dictum, which was to spend the first third of life getting as much education as he could, to spend the next third making all the money he could, and then to spend the last third giving it all away. He also wrote an essay called The Gospel of Wealth. You can read it on the Carnegie Corporation's website, and it's all about how his belief that those who gain wealth in their lifetime should donate as much of it as they can before they die. But what qualified him to write The Gospel of Wealth? Well, before his final donation spree, the man was worth $475 million. That's a lot of money. But remember, we have to adjust for inflation. In 2021 money, he was worth $15.6 billion. If he were alive today, he'd be tied for the 112th richest person in the world. That's a huge rags to riches story. We'd want to hear his gospel. He definitely practiced what he preached, donating vast amounts of his wealth to various causes throughout his life. 
He was a believer in spreading education and using his resources to promote world peace. By the end of his life, he donated a total of $350 million to all kinds of causes. His most enduring legacy is a number of organizations that he founded with the purpose of working on his vision for the future. Carnegie Corporation of New York. If you want your life's work to carry on past your actual life, set up a corporation to do it. The Carnegie Corporation was founded in 1911, and its main purpose was to fund and support educational initiatives in the U.S. and beyond. Many of the Carnegie Corporation's endowments reflect the things that were important to Andrew. For example, it funded the United States National Research Council, which serves as a scientific research academy that publishes around 200 papers every year. The Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies is a foreign policy academy and research institute that was established at Harvard University. The Carnegie Libraries were a famous project of his. It refers to over 2,500 libraries that Carnegie funded in the late 1800s, at a time when public libraries weren't really a thing. And the last one we'll mention is the Children's TV Workshop. Now you probably don't know it by that name, but everyone everywhere knows it by its current name, Sesame Street. The corporation exists to this day, and they've honestly done so much work in the field of education that we could make a whole video just about this company. We think he'd be happy with all that it has accomplished. This is one of Carnegie's lesser known ventures, but it has a very important responsibility. It exists to hold and manage one of the most important locations in the world when it comes to diplomacy and international relations. We speak of none other than The Hague. What people usually call The Hague is actually known as the Peace Palace at The Hague. It is home to the International Court of Justice, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and the Peace Palace Library. Foreign policy research institutes are important, but to build and maintain the home of one of the United Nations' most important institutions shows that Carnegie was really serious about world peace. While the UN didn't exist in his lifetime, the palace was actually built by Carnegie himself to provide a home for the Permanent Court of Arbitration. It was later, in the final years of World War II, that the United Nations set up the International Court of Justice in the Peace Palace. Besides hosting courts, the library holds tons of literature on diplomacy and foreign relations, and the palace is home to the Hague Academy of International Law. So the Peace Palace is an all-in-one solution to fulfill Carnegie's dream of a peaceful and more knowledgeable world. That wraps up today's video. What did you think of Carnegie's life? Do you think his use of his wealth is an example for today's rich people to follow? Let us know in the comments below, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe.